Welcome to another episode of the Distributed Data Show, brought to you by DataStax Academy, where we bring you the latest news and interview technical experts to help you succeed in building large-scale distributed systems. Hey everybody, Patrick McFadden, Distributed Data Show, and we are at Graph Day, and I'm here talking to Dave Beckberger. Hey Dave. Hey, how's it going, Patrick? So, uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, today we're going to talk about using graph databases in legacy applications. Oh boy. All right, so that could be about anything. Right? Yes. I think of legacy applications. Probably the worst thing I can think of when I think of legacy applications is like a mainframe. But maybe you should help us out. What's the definition that you're working with? Well, in, in my mind, almost pretty much any application you're going to build against is a legacy application because they all have some legacy component to them. You're either you're importing legacy data, you're using legacy uh, infrastructure, you have to use legacy patterns. Your team is only used to the patterns that they're used to working with. So there's always some sort of legacy part to any application building, even if it's you know new. I like to call legacy applications uh, what they really are: technical debt. Technical debt. Well, that's that's part of the legacy applications. There's always lots of technical debt. Yeah, and I mean, but I mean, this is the, the industry we live in because nothing stays around for very long. Everything is new next year. Yep. And that's why you always have to be learning. I say that all the time. Always be learning because things change all the time. Okay, so here's your problem. Uh, it's been three years, ten years maybe since you touched this application, mm -hmm. and you need to. I, I would imagine this is to modernize it for whatever. Modernize and add a new add a new feature or something new, like new that. New use case. Okay. Yeah. So where do I start? Well, I think the first thing you start about is really sitting down and figuring out what problem you're trying to solve and what the right technology to actually use solve that problem is. You know, a lot of times you'll find out as you're going through and you're working through your thing, just because it looks like a graph problem on the top of it, on the surface doesn't mean it's a graph problem under the covers. The old graph hammer, huh? Yeah, the old graph hammer. Or, or which, what I find even more common is you end up figuring out that this part of this problem is a graph problem, but this part is better served in, you know, some other type of data store, be it a search server or Cassandra or document data store, or your relational database, because let's be honest, relational databases, they still work. Yeah, they still work for a lot of things. Yeah. Okay, so you get to that point where you're like, oh, I may understand the, the requirements, hopefully. And uh, one of those, I assume, is some sort of a graph problem. Yeah. Really. Okay, so what if it's a mix, though? I mean, is there a, a good case for a mixture of use cases? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, my experience, basically, I, I'm a big proponent of using polyglot or multi-model persistence. Because, as I said, there's a lot of, you know, graphs are great for certain things. You can do most anything in it, that doesn't mean it's the right tool for that problem. You know, I, I always kind of think back, that, you know, there's the old adage, when, every, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yep. You know, make sure you use the, the right tool hammer. for the right job. Yeah, the graph hammer, graph hammer. or the relational database hammer, the you know. Hammer, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's been around for a long time. So, you know, you know, use the right tools for the right parts of your problem because, you know, for example, let's say you have an application that's very, you know, as a natural graph, maybe you're traversing through a social network, a very common thing. But at some point, you also want to be able to create a business a BI dashboard for executives. You can probably write that in a graph, but you know that data is probably already being stored in a relational database as well. It's probably better to use that for what it's good for, and use the graph for the part it's good for, and figure out a way to keep the data in sync between the two. All right. So walk me through some of this. Where um, what are some of the ways you know that this is a better fit for, say, a graph database and not a relational database? Because, I, I mean, this is, I think, a, a common pitfall with, when looking at relational versus graph is that graph is far more normalizable than a relational database. It's beyond the normalization you can get from relational. So um, you have lots of, lots of choices with graph, but what makes it a good choice? I think it comes down to the type of questions that you're really trying to answer. Um, you know, if you're truly trying to answer how things are related more, than, if your questions are more about how things are related to one another than of the things themselves. You know, let's take the social network example. You know, in a social network example, you want to find friends of friends of friends of friends. Mm -hmm. But that's really not about who the individual people are that you're working at. It's about how they're interconnected to one another. So that kind of right there, you know, uh, screams to me that this is a, a graph may be a good solution for this problem, whereas a relational database isn't so great, you know. For that sort of thing, uh, you know, in uh, one of the applications I worked on was a, a family tree application. So you were building out a family tree, which is a natural graph. You can think of it. It's, a, it's extremely hierarchical. Well, trying to figure out how one person is related to another person in a relational database is a really difficult problem to do because you have, you're traversing an unknown number of relations in an unknown direction. Yeah, and then you start writing recursive SQL. 
Yes, which if you've ever written recursive SQL, I'm sorry. Well, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> it's actually one of the doorways to hell. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a great way to burn down a, a machine because this is uh, one of the things, we're just getting a little tangent here. Recursion is awesome until it never stops. <laughs> <laughs> which is the first 50 or 60 times you try to run it. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can melt a machine. I mean, you have to have a bottom out case, right? Yes. And how do you know when the bottom out case is? No, you don't necessarily, and that's the problem, especially if you're, right. well, for the take the family tree example, you have no idea how big that family tree is or how no. far separate people are. Until there are no more relatives. Yes. <laughs> Until you've exhausted the entirety of the application. Yeah, there's no more the people. Set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, that, sure, that makes sense. I guess, um, like, bill of materials, another one of those type of yeah. problems. You, yeah, you don't know how many pieces make up that one piece that you're looking at. It's another, another very recursive sort of question where you're really caring about how things are related. Okay, all right. Um, well, all right, on the opposite side, uh, what's a common problem that you hear people say, well, that's totally a graph problem, but it, it is not a graph problem at all? Um, like, uh, well, a simple example is, I don't know if it's not a graph problem, but it may not be the best solution for it, is a search problem. Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, a lot of times people will do what will say, oh, I want to be able to search my graph to find this thing, when really what they wanted in the end is some sort of search server, something that's optimized to do, you know, fuzzy search matching. Right. Can you do it in a graph? Yes. Is it probably the best place to do it? Not normally. <laughs> mm. they're, they're just, they're not optimized to answer that sort of question, whereas if it's, you know, you put it into like DSE search, which is a, you know, a, you know, basically is optimized to do search sort of queries and tokenization. It tends to answer a better, you know, it tends to get a better answer faster. Yeah, and you're going to be doing a lot of uh, string comparisons along yeah. the way, and and it's just not where you're not you're not using a graph for the power of the graph at that point. Right. You're using a graph to get an answer. Well, if that's really what you try to do, there may be a better option out there. Got it. Okay. Yes. So I'm building my graph, and I think this is, you know, we. we talked about this, well, maybe you and I haven't talked about it on camera, but we can now, <laughs> yeah. but we talked about this whole, like, you know, taking a graph problem to production. I, I think that's a last mile problem that's, a, that's really difficult for engineers, is how do you productionalize that? And, um, see, see I, would, I guess I would make the, the argument that it's not really a last mile problem because you should be thinking about production when you start the project. I stand corrected. Because part of, because to me, uh, one of the biggest things I've seen is you get to the end and then you start worrying about scale or how am I actually mm. going to run this against, you know, how am I going to run this, this traversal against not the, you know, 200,000 nodes in my, in my graph, but my 2 billion nodes that exist in my graph, something like that. You know, you want to think about those sorts of things earlier on in the process mm -hmm. to basically try and minimize the risk of those becoming a bigger issue later on. All right. Wow, this is a lot to think about. Is there anything else I need to know? Well, it probably. I'll say is. yes, but <laughs> we only have so much. We have so, so much, much time, time today. Time and uh, daylight and electricity. <laughs> <laughs> the age of the universe. <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. This has been really helpful and interesting. Um, I'm glad you could do it, and let's do it again sometime. Sounds great. All right, everyone. Well, remember, if you love this content and you want to see Dave again, remember to subscribe and that little bell button, hit that, and you'll get notified next time something comes up. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us again for the Distributed Data Show. We love your feedback, so go to the Distributed Data Show page on Datastax Academy and tell us what you think. You can also find us on the Datastax Academy YouTube channel or find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get great podcasts. While you're there, make sure and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.